Well, hey there, and welcome to episode number 518 of Six Pixels of Separation, the Miram podcast. My name is Mitch Joel. It's Sunday, June the 12th, 2016. Let's get on with the show. So who are you and what do you do? Hey, my name is Sidney Finkelstein. I'm a professor at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College, and I write books and teach people and consult on topics around leadership and especially how very senior leaders do great things or disastrous things. Now, you've been at Tuck for, for a while. Yes, over 20 years. And, and I guess so that puts you on pace because I think you've done 20 books as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, in fact, I don't think I started writing books Maybe there were one, there's one or two before I moved uh, moved to Tuck, but uh, yeah, I've done uh, I've done a bunch of them. And your latest book that's getting a lot of attention is Super Bosses, which I'm sure most people have heard of, and it's a it's a very exciting book. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun to do this long process, but it's uh, it's actually a book that I think speaks to all sorts of different audiences. After all, everyone's had a boss, and almost everyone has been a boss at some point. And how can we get better at what we're doing and change the world at the same time? It's a pretty good question to be thinking about. So, when you if you take a step back and think about when you're ready to build and create a book, you know your area of expertise seems to be talent, executive talent, leadership, and it is. It's an area that there are so many voices on. Some of them are dissenting. Some of them are very uh, homogenous. Some of them are work in harmony with one one another. What were you looking at where you thought there's something different here that people are missing or not seeing? There's this corner that I'm interested in. Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, I wrote a book called Why Smart Executives Fail some 10 years ago and got a lot of publicity and I ended up traveling the world, working with companies, a lot of keynote speeches. And, you know, when you do that, you get a lot of interaction, a lot of questions. Everybody, of course, had one primary question, which was, how do I avoid getting onto your sequel of the book, which, of course, makes a, makes a lot of sense. Uh, but um, And I had a lot of ideas in the book about how you could avoid failure, no matter how smart you are or even or think you are. But after a period of time, I began to realize there was something else I hadn't really I hadn't really touched on as much as uh, as much as I, I came to realize how important it was, and, and that was that that to survive as an organization, to thrive as an organization for a long period of time, you really need to know how to generate and regenerate talent on a continuous basis. And it was that basic insight that got me started on what eventually became super bosses because I I started looking for people that are exceptionally good at this, and I went down a path that no one's ever gone down before, frankly. Uh, in terms of the people I looked at, um, the lessons that I drew from them, and some of the things that came out of that, re- that out of that research, a lot of them being very counterintuitive. So, uh, you know, the first my, my first instinct when I was was sort of paying attention to the work you were doing in that area was a bit of skepticism, and I, I think I have that skepticism maybe because of the professional world that I live in, which is digital marketing agencies. So again, I work I get to work in a very very high, fast-paced world that's somewhat new still. Um, I'm interfacing with brands that are trying to move at a very, very different click. And I don't know if you've seen this, but years ago in Fast Company, there was this article on Generation Flux, uh, and it featured people like one of my competitors, RGA's uh, Bob Greenberg, talking about, which is something we feel here too, it's so hard to keep talent. And forget the sort of 20-year cycle of gold watch. Uh, you know, month to month can be challenging because of opportunity. People want to leave. People want to do other things. And it's, it's. I think as a business leader, it becomes sometimes hard to to want to invest when you know these people are are and have become more and more nomadic as the years have gone on. So actually, what you're describing really raises the bar for what you need to do as a boss or, or a leader. You have to make it so compelling, so energizing, so um, valuable for, for somebody to be on your team and to work with you. And super bosses do that in a variety of ways that we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about, but very much genius is at, at motivation and inspiration. And, and here's the kicker. For a super boss, the idea that somebody stays with you for a period of time 
and then leaves is not a, a failure, it's not a bad thing. In fact, for many of super bosses, it's actually an expectation that that's the way the world, work, the world works. The idea that somebody is going to stick around for a long time has been gone, as you say, for some time. I think Fortune 500 CEOs and, and, and HR people, I, I don't think they've gotten the message quite as clearly because I, I, I've spoken to so many people in that world that keep talking about talent retention, that it's all about talent retention. So, and, uh, I, go ahead. I, was say, I, I would love to retain great talent. Who wouldn't want to retain great talent? But the reality is if we live in a world where there is this flux, and you, you're talking about it a couple of decades ago, well, it's accelerated with millennial generation and gig economy and all this other stuff. If that's the world we're in, then we really need to think about, as bosses, as leaders, we need to think about things a, a lot more cleverly and, and a lot more strategic. And that's what super bosses do to try to get the most out of people and, and create a true win-win situation. So bridge that a little bit because it's still time, effort, and energy. You want your people to be successful. And for sure, you want your people to go on and be successful wherever they are and nurture their own teams and potentially become clients. I think that model is fantastic as well. But the other side is still the fact that it gets harder and harder to invest and create those dynamics when the the time spent becomes shorter and shorter. So, But you're saying that there is that medium. Yeah, you know, the word, uh, the word to keep in mind here, I think, is intensity. Super <laughs> bosses create super intensive environments, work environments. So what, what seems like, you know, six months or a year of working with someone might seem like or might be equivalent to three or four or five years with someone else. I, I, so often, um, a whole bunch of these different protégés uh, that I talked to, there were a bunch of occasions where they worked for, say, Alice Waters, you know, the famous restaurateur from Chef Penny's in Berkeley, farm to table, local sourcing, really a, a great uh, a great innovator. And uh, there were people that had gone through her kitchens or in a restaurant for as short a time as, as six months. And it branded them for the rest of their the rest of their careers. It had a gigantic impact. And so intensity is really what, what you're trying to get at. We don't have 10 years and 20 years of developed talent. No, nobody's going to be able to do that. But super bosses have figured out how to create this type of intense world, intense environment, where the best people want that. They thrive with that. And it's very consistent with, uh, with your premise that you can't take forever to get this done. What about the exhaustion factor? So it's nice to say that there's a high level of intensity, but there's also a pushback where people want more flex. They want more home. They want, again, that more, more nomadic lifestyle, more autonomy. Does that, does that act as a, as, a counter, as a counter to it? I think it actually plays, uh, plays into the, uh, the, the super boss way of doing things because uh, you know, people could be working anywhere. They, more and more people are in virtual offices and that does, I, I will say, create a problem with respect to how super bosses love to work very closely with people, really rolling up their sleeves and working in a very intense, uh, an intense manner. When you're not face to face, it is a little bit more challenging. But that's the way the world is, and there are tons of teams with people, you know, in Singapore and in New York City and London, and they they work they they work together. So um, it's a challenge, but it's not a it's not a deal breaker. But I think the the idea of having people work. Uh, work closely, um, creating that intensity, and then saying, okay, I've done the, the year or two or five, I've done my tour of duty, as Reid Hoffman from LinkedIn calls this, and, uh, and I'm ready to try something else. And, and maybe, you know, maybe people need, I know I've done this in my own, in my own career, though I haven't jumped jobs all that, uh, all that much. I've jumped projects in the nature of my work, um, my work experience and the type of work I've done from unbelievably intense periods of time when I'm working like, like a wild man to accomplish something that is just so important to me to accomplish. And then there's a little bit of a, uh, um, of a recovery stage, if you will, when I'm, uh, when I'm kind of um, um, developing and, and benefiting from that, uh, that energy boost, and then I'm ready to start a new project. And I think that is, uh, that's a world that uh, I think we're going to see, we are seeing more and more, and I think it's one super bosses live with as well. Is it accessible to all? And what I mean by that is there are certain people who run a business. They don't necessarily have a desire for that intensity or that sort of tour duty. They're, they're running a business. They're looking at it as a long term. They might even consider this a smallish business. And on the other side, I, I think even my bigger question would be, what about for employees? I mean, you have to be able to get into an environment where you have that sort of archetype of a super boss and you know even reading the book and looking at the examples and thinking about my own world 
not that they're unicorns, <laughs> but they're there's they're probably closer on on the spectrum of a unicorn to go closer to a unicorn than the spectrum of the general bosses that we see running business today. Well, here's uh, here's the thing, you know, in 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 my book, in Super Bosses, I look at a lot of famous people, mm -hmm. the Ralph Lauren's of the world, Lauren Michaels, George Lucas, and on and on. And the reason I did that was a a choice, a research choice, which is. I was able to find them. I wanted to know if they existed. First of all, I was able to find them. And then I was able to identify protégés to truly, truly understand, you know, what is it that they do that's separate? But I've come to realize, so actually I knew it even when I was writing the book because I talked to so many people. But since the book is, is, has been out for a very short time, I've been talking to even more people. And, you know, you do book signings and people want, want the book to be signed to their boss. Who they say is a super boss, somebody in the middle or even lower level of a of a giant company. I, I never heard. I would never know who they were. So the point is that there are super bosses, up and down organizations. I don't think they're nearly enough. I I don't think I would call them. I would call them unicorns. Ralph Lauren and some of these superstars. Yeah, there's not a ton of those. But uh, the 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 embracing of a lot of the super boss ideas in the super boss playbook. Yeah, I do think there there are a lot. Now, what about your, what about on the issue of the employers? Yeah. Yeah, to your other part of the question, employees, I don't believe the super boss world is for everyone. You got to be willing to play and play hard. And I know that there are plenty of people who are perfectly happy to put in their whatever, 30, 40, 50 hours a week. And, and they, they're not interested in changing the world. They want, they want to make a living. And that's fine. And I, I, I don't say anything negative about that. But those are not the people that are going to be creating the next innovations. They're not the people that are going that you need to build an organization on when you're when you're uh, uh, striving to accomplish some new and exciting and difficult things in a in a really competitive world. So not for everyone, but for a gigantic number of people that have those aspirations, have those ambitions. Then finding the super boss, finding a super boss or multiple super bosses to work for over the course of your career, and especially earlier on when the learning curve is steeper, is uh, is just a big plus. And so that's that, so you know you're right. It's not for, it's not for everyone, but I do think it's for a lot of people. But even if the people that it's for, those jobs feel to me as somebody who you know, I'm blessed. I get to like you. I get to speak and and work with amazing brands. And when I see the people who are surrounded by these super bosses, it's less about do I want that lifestyle? I think there are, there are a, a lot of people who do, but they still, even at that level, it's hard to get a gig with a super boss because when people are like that, everybody wants that gig. It's true that people want to work for a super boss and you could even track that within an organization. But if you buy the premise that there are super boss like people – and you know we're talking about super boss. You're a, you're it's a yes or a no. You are or you're not. And there obviously there are people like that. But realistically, like most things, you, it, it's kind of like a scale. You're very much like a super boss. You know, it's like a one to ten scale. And if you're anywhere above you know seven or eight, then you're living in a super boss world. So um, as soon as you define it, maybe not quite as strictly, there really are a lot of those a lot of those people. And I think the challenge then becomes, well, how do you find them? And, and I spent a bit of time thinking about that. And I know when I talk to student groups, MBA audiences, people earlier in their career, and there's Q&A, that's one of the first things they're raising their hand they want to know about. And, and I got a bunch of ideas. I mean, for example, just take one example. When you're interviewing for a job with a, pros with a person, not an HR person, but a person who's going to be your boss, you should be interviewing the interviewer at the same time. That should be part of your thing, and you're not doing it in an unfriendly or inappropriate way. But you're 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 asking questions like, um, tell tell me about some of the people that worked for you over the, over the last few years, and where they've gone, what they're doing, and you know how their careers have have, have developed. Um, are you in touch with people, or how do you stay in touch with people that used to work for you? Um, how do you spend a typical day? You, usually you want to know what your day looks like. But I like to ask, I think we should be asking your prospective boss, what does their day look like? And what, you're, what I think you want to look out for is somebody who says, oh, my God, I'm going from meeting to meeting to meeting. I, I, that, you know, that's not a – Tons of email, not, yeah. <laughs> super bosses will not let them I – mean, look, if I could outlaw meetings – then you know I uh, uh, they they put me on uh, on Mount Rushmore or something. Uh, uh, they they exist, but do you have to let that dominate your your world? And Superboss will not let that happen because they they believe in freelancing. They believe in having some time to talk to people and and stepping in and working closely with some of their proteges. 
you, you made an interesting statement. You said, you know, either you are or you aren't a super boss. And if I were to flip that and say, okay, so when you are speaking to leaders and they've read your work and they've been exposed to your thinking, are there people who are sort of like right on the edge and they're sort of looking for coaching of how, like meaning if I have to ask for coaching to become a super boss, can I ever become a super boss is I guess where I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think, uh, I think the answer has got to be yes. It's a, it's a different form of the question, you know, how innate is this? Right. Can it be taught? And, uh, and, and I'm firmly convinced that virtually everything, maybe everything even in the super boss playbook, as I call it, can be taught. It is teachable. It is learnable. I'm not going to say everybody will learn at the same pace, and I'm not going to say everybody starts at the same place. But that because that's just not the way it is. But given that, I know that say if I was if I was coaching if I was coaching you and you want to be more of a I know you're already a super boss, Mitch. Well, but if you want to be more of a super boss, <laughs> um, uh, I could take you from you know make up some numbers level level six to level eight or nine uh, or even ten. I I know I could do that. Uh, I know how to do that, and. Uh, and that's and and that means anyone can can do it. Now, if you told me you're in a company with uh, a thousand people, I couldn't do it by coaching a thousand people. Of course, I wouldn't have any time. And and that creates an, a really interesting challenge, which um, um, is actually what I'm spending a lot of time on right now. Which is how do you scale this? How do you institutionalize this into an organization so that it's not dependent on that one or small number of super bosses, so that you can continue to create and develop super bosses. Am I reading this right that you're saying that in the world of super bosses, there is a more heavier weight towards nurture than nature? Because that's surprising to me. I would have thought that it's it's a nature thing. No, I think it's uh, absolutely a nurture, absolutely something that, that you can do. Uh, and, you know, part of it is look, look at who I am. I'm a teacher by profession. I'm a professor in a university. My job is to help other people learn how to do stuff that could be useful in their lives. So... I'm not uh, so. I'm starting from a place that says you could teach almost anything. Uh, I think it's, by the way, true for creativity, which many people will say, you know, you either have it or you don't. And I'm not going to say that I or oh, I'm not a teacher of you know, of arts or creativity. But let's say I was. I'm not going to say that I could make you into Picasso. That's stupid. Uh, but I could take you wherever you are to become more innovative and more of a creative thinker. Leadership and any aspect of leadership is the same thing. I can't easily teach you how to be more charismatic although even there there are a lot of people that specialize in things you know the word is um executive presence that's the that's the buzzword people use that you you need to build that personal or executive presence when you walk in a room that that people are paying attention to you and there are all kinds of techniques often drama teachers you know theater arts teachers teaching people how to do it anyways i say all that to point out that in fact i firmly believe that an incredible amount of, of leadership skills and ideas, including all the stuff around super bosses, can be taught and people can get better. Okay, now I want to move into an area that you spent a ton of time working on, and it's an area that I'm fascinated with. And I think even considering where the world is at today, it's super important, which is your previous book. It was called Why Smart Executives Fail. And in Super Bosses, you talk a lot about why capable leaders also make bad decisions. This has always been an area that's been super interesting to me. We look at failure as being a bad thing, and yet we have a counter-cyclical culture in the valley where it's like, how many times have you failed? So your next unicorn is just around the corner. Fail fast, fail soon, fail is good. Where do you sit on this whole failure good, failure bad thing? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question because um, there's been a bit of a cyclicality around that. In the earlier internet boom of the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, building up into that, the idea of failure was was all of a sudden seen as a badge of honor. If you haven't failed, then uh, you're just not as good as somebody else. And um, uh, and and then everything blew up, and there was a little bit less excitement around failure. And now we're back again, kind of in a cyclical way, because uh, because we have such a booming economy, especially in uh, in the Silicon Valley world, and so many so many new technolo- technology related uh, uh, startups. That failure is, again, and this is not brand new, but been going on for several years, is again seen as a very big, um, as a, much more of a positive than a negative. So I guess the first thing is let's acknowledge there are there is some cyclicality to what the cultural norms are in business about failure. Second, uh, how you treat failure, how you manage failure in an organization turns out to be one of the most important cultural factors in how you, in what kind of organization you're building. Are you punishing or are you looking at it as a 
as an investment that you made. And maybe you heard the, the famous story, I may have even included in Why Smart Executives Fail, famous story about Tom Watson, the founder, the son of the founder of IBM, and there's a, there's a young uh, manager that uh, makes a huge mistake and costs the company a million dollars, and he's called up to see the CEO, and he's shaking in his boots, and he's sitting there, and, and the CEO's of Tom Watson's asking him questions about what happened and what, what went on, and and, uh, and in the end, Tom Watson says, okay, go back to work and, and make sure you're learning from this. And the kid blurts out, you know, you mean you're not going to fire me? He says, why should I fire you? I just invested a million dollars in you. Right. So it, it's, you know, that's the, that's, that's the approach that starts to dominate, I think, in more robust uh, cultures. I do talk about it in super bosses a little bit because super bosses create very innovative environments. Innovation means risk taking. Risk taking means failure. So if you're going to just hammer somebody who messes up, you're not going to be able to create that type of culture that that super bosses create, which is all about all about learning, all about innovation. I have a quick anecdote about that. Jay Shiat, who was the founder of Shiat Day, a legendary advertising agency. He used to even reward his his creative people when they didn't get the deal, they didn't get the the contract or the assignment. If they if they presented something that was really cutting edge, really creative, and the client was was actually afraid that it was going too far in the creativity uh, dimension, the CEO would reward people for that. He says, "That's what I want you to do. Of course, I want you to get the deal, but I don't want us to lose because we're timid. I'd rather we lost because we're we're further we're further ahead of everybody else." So. Yeah. You know, there's a culture for it. And it's also magnified. And the reason I say this is because I'm Canadian and I can. I look at, like, for example, Donald Trump and the pres- presidency. And there's a lot of that sort of rhetoric around he's this failed business guy. And look at all these failures. And, you know, I, I, I laughingly, because I don't have to vote and live with this, I can sort of counter look at that and go, well, yeah, people to get to that level of business fail a ton. And sort of highlighting that as some sort of like uh, negative thing is an actual fact. People who who have in some way, and I'm not saying he's done it well or not well, it's not relevant, but have reached whatever that level is. And that's also, I guess, debatable in its own world. Mm-hmm. But that level with the B in front of it instead of the, you know, from the billion instead of the million in front of it, there are, there's tons of, the road is littered with failures typically and bad deals and, and problems. I have two things to say in response to that. Number number <laughs> one, <laughs> probably 20 things, right? But, exactly. Uh, no, 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 number one, failure is a, a colossal waste of time if you haven't learned anything from it. That's the key thing. And so, and this is true when people say, you know, if you haven't failed and you haven't, the, the, the assumption is, and that's consistent with what you said, you know, in the Valley and how people think, the assumption is you learn something. And the Why Smart Executives Fail research that I did in the book that I wrote proved to me and many others that, in fact, people do not learn from failure all the time. In fact, we don't learn from failure nearly enough. And that's because we come up with excuses. We come up with all these reasons why it shouldn't, uh, it wasn't our fault. I mean, I interviewed lots of people asking them, what went wrong? How'd you screw up? <laughs> uh, I didn't use, I didn't quite say it that way, but how did, how, how did this thing fall apart? And I had, uh, there were a number of people telling me all these reasons why it was going on that had nothing to do with them. So, so the first thing is, are we learning from failure? Did Donald Trump since that's who you brought up, did he learn from from the fail from the bankruptcies that that occurred? And I I haven't interviewed him. I haven't spent time with him. I, but I haven't seen any evidence of uh, I haven't seen any evidence of uh, of of that at all. And, and then the the the, the second thing um, about uh, about Trump and this ties together both of the books that we're we're talking about right now is um, the difference between. The failing CEOs in Why Smart Executives Fail that had that that were big ego, big personality, powerful, um, uh, charismatic uh, people versus some of the CEOs in Super Bosses that were big personalities, uh, powerful people, charismatic uh, people. There were, not all Super Bosses are like that. There are different types, but there was one type that I found. I call them glorious bastards, and it gives you a sense of. Who they are. Larry Ellison is, is kind of the classic example. And so when I was doing the research and realizing that there's this class of people called that I call glorious bastards, I had to figure out why, you know, they sound a little bit similar to some of the why smart executives fail leaders. And what I came to realize is that there's a fundamental difference between these two groups of people. And the difference is that the, the, the super bosses, while they, they have this big personality, 
and this big ego, they are able to, 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 to step aside and make room for other people. They recognize that to win, they need the world's best talent around them. They need to help those people get better. They need to develop those, that, that, type of, uh, that type of machinery and that type of, uh, um, of talent pool in an organization. The Why Smart Executives Fail leaders looked at other people as almost irrelevant. They figured there's no one who knows more about any topic than, than I can possibly know. So while they had big egos, there's a big difference in how they, uh, in how they thought about the importance of other people around them. And we're talking Trump, so you know he's in the news every second day about something that relates exactly to this point. The most recent one is when he was asked, I think in a CNN interview, just a couple of days ago, very recently, that uh, you know who's who's on your foreign policy uh, team, and his first uh, answer was, you know, well, I listen to myself, and I'm the one, um, and I'm I'm pretty good at this, and uh, that's you, you'd never hear that from a super boss. Super bosses, they know they're pretty good, but they have so much self confidence. This is kind of kind of kind of intriguing. They have so much self confidence that they're able to step aside and make room for other people. And I look at some of the big ego people and why smart executives fail. And I, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist and I didn't have them on the couch uh, asking about their mother and father, but I think that many of them are actually highly insecure. And, and, and that would be my assumption about, about the, about a Trump like personality to, to, to be behaving the way that he does. It, it, it just seems like he do, he's not nearly as confident as he, uh, as he, as he seems to be. Um, and the contrast to super bosses is dramatic. And I like the I like the way you connect the dots between failure and learning from failure because people always would ask me and I've had you know in my second book Control All the Lead I talk about I've had a very squiggly career and that I tend to find that the more interesting people that we want to be led by or that we perceive as leaders have had these sort of very squiggly careers where it's not as linear as one would suspect and you know, the, what are the pivotal moments? And, and again, in my own anecdotal way, which is probably not even close to the depth of research you did, was it was that time when you were fired. It was that time when you were failed, but what you did at that moment. And so to me, that learnable experience is a is a great connection to that failure thing. Because again, we, we applaud failure without talking about what it means to the next step though and how to make those connections. So I'm glad you did that in such a, in such a cogent way. Thank you for that. Um, I'm also really curious about this area, which clearly is core to super bosses, this idea that great leaders spawn these protégés and these protégés go on to transform industries. My experience has been with a lot of the brands that we would sort of look to as having super bosses that a lot of times the, the protégés the protégés exist and the infrastructure is set up, but as the protégés ascend, sometimes they just become really great at what they do and they actually they themselves don't want to assume super boss roles or they don't want to necessarily do things that are transformative they just want to keep getting great at what they do um, a great example of this and i'm only saying this anecdotally is apple it is an environment where you become greater and greater what you do there through friends i've heard privately um that they really want you to sort of stay in that position and keep at it mm -hmm. yeah well that's the same thing at amazon they, uh, they, they, they love to, they love to keep you there and keep you there forever. And, and I'm not going to say that it's a bad idea to keep the best talent. That would be crazy, but you have to create a world where they find it in their, in their interest to stay and not go and create, you know, the spin off in some other company and create some other business. The truth is that, um, Apple, you look over time at the people that worked, work there. So many of them have gone on to get involved in all kinds of startups and all kinds of companies. And uh, I recognize in the case of, a, of an Apple, and this is true for some other companies, maybe a bunch of companies in Silicon Valley, when, they're, when, when you're successful, the amount of wealth you get is, is non-trivial. And that enables you. I mean, it gives you tons of freedom. You could, do, you could take all kinds of chances in, in your career. But um, uh, uh, so there's, there's two things. One is within Apple, lots of people have left to be successful and, and do, do, their own, do their own thing in their own, in their own businesses. But they would love to, uh, they'd, love to keep, uh, they'd love to keep as many as they can, and Jeff Bezos is exactly like that as well. How do you do that? There's only one way I could think of, really, because we're going beyond wealth when you're in a company like that. You've made, you've made plenty of money, and it has to be that, you, that you're creating a growing organization that is creating newer and newer opportunities so you can keep, in a sense, you're not leaving the, the mothership, 
but the mothership itself is changing so dramatically that you're getting bigger and bigger opportunities within the same within the same ecosystem within the same company and that's the beauty of growth growth is the one thing you can do that enables you to be to ad- adopt the super boss playbook and end up retaining talent more than the typical super boss might if you can't create that level of growth but you just also do find some people get to that level and there's there they themselves have self-realized and are content with sort of running a line of business versus even though they're capable of becoming that super boss or transforming the industry, there is that part of the world too. It's not that everyone's on this sort of hunger path. No, that's true. There's a lot of variation. Not everybody wants to. Uh, not everybody wants to do that. I think. I think it's the question is really not a yes or yes or a no, but a likelihood type of question. You work for a super boss. The likelihood of having opportunities and having the, the personal aspiration to do more and create something on your own, whether it's entrepreneurial or working in another company where you have a bigger job, I think the likelihood is much higher, but it's definitely not a, um, an absolute. Who was the most inspire, uh, surprising super boss? Like you sort of went in and thought, yeah, but there was like a sort of real like gasp for you where like, I can't, didn't expect that. Well, there were, there were probably a couple. And uh, I mean, Larry Ellison has to, has to be one. Plenty of people that I talk to about Larry Ellison, especially in the Valley, think I'm completely wrong about that. Because they're equating super boss with something that is got some other characteristics that I don't uh, that I'm not I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on the ability to develop the world's best talent. Well, Larry passes that test from from Mike Seashoals to Craig Conway to Ray Lane, uh, Mark Benioff running Salesforce.com, in a long, long uh, list. But he did it in a pretty um, and does it in a very aggressive uh, way. It's not an easy place to work. It never has been an easy place to work, and so. I would say that uh, that one is, is one of the more surprising ones. There are probably two. Now, that's definitely one that's, that's surprising to uh, a little bit to me, but I quickly figured out in, through the research that he had this track record, but especially other people. And, and then the other one, and, uh, and this is obviously someone I didn't talk to, is Miles Davis. And, uh, you know, the legendary jazz trumpeteer mm. and band leader and, and, and true genius. And uh, very few people who, who, if you're not from the world of jazz, or you just know, you know, you've heard of, well, everyone's heard of Miles Davis. It sounds like a crazy idea. This, this guy that had a very challenging personal life, did a lot of crazy things, was the opposite of a, you know, Fortune 1000 type company uh, that he could be a super boss. But in fact, you look at the people that were, that he discovered or that he helped get better in his bands. And we're talking about, you know, Herbie Hancock and, Bill Evans and Wayne Shorter, John Coltrane. Um, the, the actual list is is endless. It's it goes on and on and on. So he has that. Uh, he passes that that test. And then when you go and, and and talk to some of his proteges, which is what what I did, and somebody like Miles Davis, there have been dozens and dozens of books written about about what he's uh, about what he did in his life. And obviously, we read all of those very carefully. And you get lots of stories and examples that that show you, you know, this wasn't an accident. He he knew how to select people, but he raised the bar on you ov- overnight. I mean, I remember one story with um, uh, Herbie Hancock when when he was really giving Herbie Herbie Hancock a, a tryout, uh, in, if you will. And he was in his uh, he brought him into his house and he set him up in his um, on a piano in the in the living room and he said, "I want you to play and practice and uh, and and I'll come back later and uh, we'll play a little bit together." And uh, Miles Davis goes upstairs and he has this kind of private intercom system going on where he could hear everything that Herbie Hancock is playing. And he didn't tell Herbie Hancock that. And he's listening and studying uh, what Hancock is doing. Her- Herbie's playing for hours, doesn't know what the heck is going on. And finally, Miles Davis shows up and he explains what's going, what, what he's doing. Then they start jamming a little bit, a little bit together. I mean, they, they, they put people through, uh, through a, lot of, a lot of steps. If they if they want to make sure they've got the right the right person, and then of course creativity and innovation is not a shocker in the world of jazz. But uh, he Miles Davis always demanded, expected, demanded people to come up with something new. You want you you're going on stage, and before you go on stage, he'd tell you in obviously a very colorful language that you you better raise your game. You better have something new for for me tonight because if you don't don't bother don't bother coming up and. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, when I when I read about that and heard about that, I, I thought, well, this that's kind of encapsulates a lot of what super bosses do, even the Fortune 1000 type, the more mainstream business type. So, Miles Davis was 
probably the single most unusual super boss that uh, that I came across. What about on the other side of the spectrum? Because that sounds like, I mean, to me as an outsider hearing the stories, it sounds like a lot of fear and intimidation and sort of like someone on a pedestal want to impress Miles, want to impress Larry. There's a figure, there's a known brand around you know, like this person can be intimidating because they're so good at their skill. I have a bit of fear about this because, you know, are my are my chops up to up to snuff to to jam with Miles or to jam with Larry, to be quite honest. On the other side of the spectrum, were there leaders who were the opposite of fear and intimidating that were sort of these soft, um, this sort of <laughs> strong and silent types? I guess? <laughs> yeah, well, I uh, I didn't come across any super bosses that were silent. That's for sure because they uh, they are teachers. But uh, there were there were a whole bunch that uh, probably were closer to what what you're you're thinking of. Somebody like a uh, a norm a Norman Brinker who was he founded Chili's restaurant chain and mm-hmm. uh, steak and ale and um, out of his company came uh, P F Chang and Lone Star and many others. So many people running these companies actually today. Uh, Got their start, or at some stage worked for Norm Brinker, and uh, and he uh, I, uh, and he's in the category I call the nurturer, very very much of a nurturer, and and close to what you're you're really asking, but very very supportive. Uh, but none of these guys were soft touches. You had to produce, you had to perform, and that of course no, that that shouldn't make anyone anyone you know lose a minute sleep. That's the way the world is, anyways. So uh, why not have the opportunity to work with somebody who? Who has that uh, that that capability and that interest? And for for people like Norm Brinker, Tommy Friss from HCA Hospital Corporation of America was another one. They um, uh, they really saw part of what their job was uh, to help other people get better. Not only because they cared about other people, and they did, but they knew it also would help them get better. And uh, the word legacy actually comes in. They uh, they they thought about that. They thought about what their legacy was going to be. And I think somebody like Larry Ellison, he has talked about legacy, but it's more, it's more in retrospect. When you look back and say, wow, you know, look at all this, I'm going to claim credit for that. Mm-hmm. It's not that he cared about any of those people as much as he cared about winning. The Norm, the Norm Brinkers and the, um, the, the Tommy Frist, they did care about their people. I'm curious about what you took back in terms of diversity by gender, by even minority, and I'd say even by age. I mean, I, it sounds to me like these super bosses had to skew older as well because they had so much experience under their belts. Did you, was there a lot of diversity? Was there a lot of gender diversity, national, you know, minority-based diversity, age diversity, or, or dear Lord, are we back to that tumbler of all-white male panel? <laughs> yeah, well... There, uh, there really wasn't as much diversity as uh, I personally would have liked, but the data took me where the data took me. And if you think about it, to become a super boss, and especially these uh, leaders of industries, again, I wasn't looking at the super boss that's in the middle of a company that would be a different type of different type of profile. Uh, you had to have been doing what you're doing for a couple of decades, for sure. So automatically, there's an age uh, there's an age factor. Uh, second, it turns out that most are uh, most are white males. Why? I think it's a reflection of if you look at people who've been doing doing what they're doing at the very top of an organization for twenty or thirty years. Well, we know if you look at that population, it is overwhelmingly white uh, white male. If we were, I, I, I'm quite confident if I were to go back, you know, in ten years, let's say, and do do a uh, a follow up study, I know that I would find many more women. And uh, many more minorities. Now, of course, with the, that's not to say there were none. I mention and, and, and profile in uh, in super bosses people like well, I mentioned Alice Waters from Chef Penny's restaurant, high end restaurant business. Uh, Oprah as a tremendous developer, you know, Doctor Phil and Doctor Oz and so many so many others. Um, even Hillary Clinton gets in for her, her ability to develop along with Bill. A tremendous, a, tr- a tremendous network. The former governor of uh, of Texas, um, um, Kay Richardson, uh, is uh, is profile as someone who's produced a ton of uh, a ton of tremendous talent. Um, Sheryl Sandberg, still even for her, slightly early in her career, but there's already lots of evidence. I think that she's uh, that she's helped uh, helped generate a lot of great talent. So um, so I think part of it is a reflection of who I was looking at, people with. With that, with that long track record, is going to skew a certain a certain way. Um, but I do uh, uh, I do think, and in fact, people 
as you go on the road and do book talks and talk to a lot of people and start to consult on, on, on all this, uh, I, I've heard from a bunch of people that think that there's a lot of parts of the Superboss playbook that plays to the, let's call it the stereotypical strengths of women. And, and especially on this latter part, when you asked me about, you know, were there people that weren't, weren't um, managing by fear and intimidation? I mentioned Brinker, I mentioned Tommy Frist, Alice Waters, people like that. And I think that uh, that nurturing style that helps other people accomplish more, helps other people get better. I think um, I think there are a lot of people that that, that believe that there will be um, and that there are uh, plenty of, uh, of of women that uh, that will qualify and that will be great candidates for this as well. Hmm. The the other area that I'm fascinated with is I found myself constantly like going into the vortex of these leaders as respectable as they are and as fascinating as they are and the businesses that they serve awesome and i'm a huge like nerd over lauren michaels and whenever howard stern talks about lauren michaels i'm interested or people who are on saturday night live talk about lauren michaels i'm interested because of how long he's done it and how well he's targeted the word that you've used i think you've used it is they're also iconoclasts and it's a word that I love. I just love saying it. I think I sound intelligent when I say it. Um, and it's a word that I've just, I'm always interested in these types of leaders, these types of what I would call characters. And I was watching a biography many years ago on Steve Jobs, as many people have, and somebody referred to him as incompatible. Mm. And uh, it, that's a word that really stuck with me. And I, I think it stuck with me because I think some people might even see my leadership style as being a bit like that, the way I you know, blog or do these podcasts and write books. And it's not a, a sort of compatible with what is typically done in, in my industry or, or maybe in, in other industries too, where they're not like anyone else. And yet they are leaders. And, they, and it's to me such a strange duality of these people that we would normally look at and say they're, they're very out there and they're completely incompatible. And yet we laud them up as these super bosses sometimes. Yeah, that is a really interesting uh, thing to uh, to chew on. Um, certainly, and I didn't start looking for this originally, but it turns out that almost without exception, super bosses are very, very innovative. They they have redefined their industries in some in some cases. So um, if that means that that they're somewhat incompatible, then it pro- it's probably accurate because if you just do what everybody else does and you just get along, then you're not going to be the same type of uh, the same type of uh, innovator. Now, I guess the, the, the other thing I would say is, and, and it gets to this innovation, creativity um, aspect of what, um, of what all super bosses care about. Uh, I was talking to somebody just the other day uh, from Wall Street, and uh, he talked about what was going on and the aftermath in terms of talent, the aftermath of the, of the meltdown, the, um, the Great Recession and the, the blow up in 2007 and eight, and, and the follow up. And, and what he said to me is that so many, um, it was, what, what, what that whole disaster pointed out to a lot of people is we, we, meaning Wall Street firms, need to become much more flexible, adaptable, adjustable. We become way too rigid and we fell into a trap of, that, of our own making that almost took us all under. Set, first point. Second point, well, do we have the talent to do that? And the answer was no. Uh, there's been a lot of changeover of talent within uh, within a lot of Wall Street firms, people people have come up through through traditional means in Wall Street and become deep experts in one in one area and have a particular point of view. You can you need some of those people to be sure. But I think the point that that this particular person was making to me is that we we need more adaptability. We need to adjust our organizations. And the word culture, of course, has gotten a lot of play on for the entire banking industry. You know, was culture a problem with the, with the meltdown in the banking industry? The answer, of course, is, is yes. I don't know why you have to even ask that. Mm-hmm. But there's a deeper recognition that that's a problem and we need to do something about that. So it turns out that the financial services industry, and I'm not going to say all of it, but one of the trends that's going on there and this rise of our, our, our understanding of culture is playing right into the hands of the world of super bosses because super bosses – create innovative, adaptable, adjustable organizations. And in, in, in some ways, that is the single most important thing that from an organizational point of view, from a corporate point of view, that a super boss actually does. As super bosses create organizations that are actually, I, I say, built to change. If you remember one of um, Jim Collins' uh, great built books, to last, yeah. built to last. And I think actually it's not what you want. I think what you want is to create an organizations built to change. 
turns out if you are flexible, adaptable, adjustable, you can, you can ride the waves, you can deal with the, the disruptions that are going on everywhere, um, and you have a chance. If you are rigid you, uh, and, and you have a culture that can't adjust, then, then, then the odds of you making that, making it through the next transition is much, is much lower. So I think built to, built to change is what we want to create. I even talk about it briefly in the book. I think that's what super bosses create. They create organizations that built to change. And when you do that, you actually increase the odds that you, you will be built to last. That's, that's the beauty of the whole thing. There's a nuance in what I'm hearing you talk about and figuring out that sort of connecting point between Superboss visionary innovation and making it work within the functional organization by obviously leveraging this idea of spawning proteges and moving that idea forward. Is the sticking point that most of the leaders who can't attain that level of super boss just struggle with at a very simplistic level. Obviously there's probably other dynamics at play, but this idea of delegation, like it's just like, ugh, like delegation's a hard thing. And if I'm going to be in charge and in command, I got to, you know, or is delegation one of those really powerful keys to being a super boss? Well, obviously it is. Yeah, of course. Delegation. Look, if you, if, if part of what you do in your life is helping other people get better, you got to throw them in the deep end sometimes. You got to give them those opportunities. And more broadly about delegation, it's something I've seen in my own coaching and consulting work for, for years and years that predates super bosses. You show me someone who's a lousy delegator and doesn't delegate a lot, and I'm going to show you someone that almost certainly doesn't trust the people on her team or on his team. And, and, and the other thing I'm, you're often going to see is this is someone that was a great individual contributor that as they moved up to get that managerial job, so now I'm talking with people a bit earlier in their career, um, they, they got their first management job, management of other people. They, they, how'd they get that job? They got it because they were probably better than most other people. And so they now are in charge of, people, of others that are not quite as good at doing whatever the technical work happens to be. You're an engineer, you're, you're a coder, you're an accountant, I don't know, what, whatever you are. And, uh, and so there's a natural tendency for people like that to actually do the work for somebody else. And then you go into the worst part of micromanagement, which is doing somebody else's work, and you end up, being, uh, you, you, you end up failing. And that, that, that's another reason why I think spending time trying to assess super bosses know, or, or people that are moving up in an organization, how much of a super boss are you, what are your weak spots, your strengths, is, is, it could be, a really, could be a really valuable thing. And delegation is a gigantic part of it. They, they delegate. Uh, extensively, they create their. You know, Larry Ellison was was known as somebody. Some one of the people I interviewed said, "If there's one thing Larry produces, it's that he produces opportunity. That's the business he's in. The business mm. of creating opportunities for other people. There's not there are not too many you know bosses listening to us right right now, Mitch. That would say, wow, I would like to be known for that too.' Wouldn't that's that inspiring. Yeah, and that's that's what it is. Super inspired. And the last thing I want you to mention, talk about, I want to let you go, but I just got to ask you this, is the power of networking and networks. It seems to me that the perception from outside would be to look at people like a Steve Jobs and a Larry Ellison and think they live in these sort of ivory towers. But when you get, if you can get somewhat close to these inner circles, and I've been I wouldn't say privy enough to, but I've been sniffing around uh, on an outside scale at it. Um, what I see is tremendously powerful networks. And I think people on the ascent to trying to figure out if they want to be a super boss or work with a super boss sometimes don't understand the power of these networks that these people have at that level. And that at every level, there are networks that can be built because that's really where Sometimes power resides, the ability to grow profit resides, the ability to grow your, your knowledge base resides. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Mitch. Imagine, imagine you have a problem, a business problem, and you've got a bunch of people you can call. They're going to return your phone calls, and they're actually going to have some ideas for you, and they'll be happy that you call them. Uh, imagine that you have some of this great talent. As we said earlier, they're going to move on. They're going to do something else. But because they had this experience with you, because you were partly responsible for their success – they are going to be, they'll, they'll do anything for you. They'll, they'll create opportunities for you. Uh, and imagine you have really good talent that are about to move off. And, and then you say, well, let's be strategic about this. And let's try to actually have some type of win-win mutual benefit. And this is what, this is what super bosses do all the time. You mentioned uh, Lauren Michaels earlier. Lauren Michaels is a perfect example. You look at NBC. 
late night TV, and there are two shows. And it's, who all are him. it's all him. <laughs> it's all him. There, Seth Meyers and and Jimmy Fallon. They both were, of course, you know, legendary players on SNL, and they were ready to leave. And in fact, they were going to leave. It's not that Lauren Michaels could say, "Please stay. I'll give you another million dollars." They, they're not going to stay. They're mo- they're they're developing their career. But what Lauren Michaels did, and this is this is a genius to his management. I'm, I'm going to say not just the creative side is he helped them get those jobs as the host of those two shows. And by the way, who's the executive producer of those? I was going to say he takes a little taste too. It's not all for goodwill. <laughs> and and this is what you should do. What is wrong with that? That that's why it's a win win. And I saw so many super bosses actually actually do that. And it really does speak to your question about about networks. They're uh, they're immensely powerful. They're something that people should be should be working on early in their career. And it's not just the kind of stereotypical networking thing that people talk about, which is well, I, w- I went to a mixer or, you know, I uh, every now and then I talk to some. I mean, they are actively managing those networks. That's a that's an asset for them. That's and they cool. understand black, that it's black belt level super bossing. <laughs> for sure. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk with me. It's a fascinating book, Super Bosses. Check it out. So let people know where they can connect to what you're doing online. Absolutely. So uh, certainly you can find me on Twitter, and it would be at Sid Finkelstein, S-Y-D, S-Y-D Finkelstein. You can also look at my website, superbosses.com. I have actually a little quiz that says, are you a super boss? And you can take that and, and get a sense of where you, uh, where you rank. And, um, and of course, you can, uh, you can connect with me through email and uh, through the website as well. So there's lots of ways to get.